so good morning everyone we are live now so welcome to upsc cse in english with an academy i am sidhi bangar your friend mentor and educator very good morning to everyone please let me know who is live as of now who all are there in the class ping me on the chat so that i'll know that you are here so briefly about me i'm sidhi bangar i graduated from bit mesra appeared for four mains in interviews and did my uh, mba and hr from xlr i am shethpur this is my an academy profile you can follow me here to get all the updates from me and ping me on the message in the an academy app i will surely reply so um let's proceed at an academy you get daily live classes like the one that uh, we have and a lot of you are already attending those classes with me at 8:30 pm every single day so all, we also have live test and quizzes that's what i'm taking here also prelims uh, test series and the courses are aligned to the upsc syllabus and one subscription of an academy gives you access to all the live and recorded courses that are running on the platform the, uh, please download the an academy learning app to keep a track of your learning and we also have a very unique program called the an academy iconic program it is both for the freshers and for the repeat aspirants uh under this program apart from all the benefits of the plus courses you also get a personal mentor who will be there assisting you throughout the uh, upsc journey you can interact with that person on whatsapp telegram phone calls whatever floats your boat so under the iconic program you get the benefits of plus classes that is live classes test series unlimited practice structured schedule that means not only you can make use of the entire an academy platform for studying you also get a personal coach daily mains q and a practice a study planner and a personalized feedback from somebody who is way more experienced in the upsc field uh, a 12 month iconic is for 64000 a 24 month is for 99000 If uh, you use my code SBUS, you get an instant ten percent off on any of the UPSC subscription categories, making one year iconic for fifty seven six hundred and two year iconic for eighty nine one hundred. Going further under the plus, again if you use my code SBUS for any subscription under the UPSC CSE category, you get a ten percent off. So for one year it is forty four thousand, comes down to thirty nine six hundred if you use my code SBUS. and for 2 years it is 64000 comes down to 57600 if you use my code sbus with that use the code sbus for any subscription under the an academy uh, upsc csc subscriptions and choose wisely choose an academy and choose iconic this is my special class it goes live at 8:30 pm essentially happens daily it's a prelims mini mock test series which will continue till 4th of october that means i mean a day before till your prelims end so we cover the entire year's current affairs the an academy test series is completely dedicated to current affairs only on the youtube i take both current affairs and static gk with that we'll start for today so the ground rules everybody knows and let me know who's there good morning uh, so kittor is here afreen is here sanjeev is here jairam is here who else is here let me know who else is here so coming here the first and the most important ground rule is feel free to be wrong it is okay to make mistakes however if you do make silly mistakes you get scolded by me that is a given don't be sad if there are mistakes it is okay i mean we are humans we will make mistakes but remember where you have succeeded so that you can replicate it mostly for all the questions 20 seconds to 25 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer except for the rapid fire round where only 30 seconds to read and answer and definitely it's a morning session morning 11 am so enjoy if your morning goes well your entire day goes well and your preparation goes well i believe that you improve each day you believe that too that we'll improve together each day and in fact i have seen some definitely good improvements in uh, my regular students so be regular we'll definitely see the improvements even though it's just 40 days to prelims we will definitely make it to the prelims so with that we'll start today good morning ram good morning kaveri uh good morning navin all right so let's start with the monthly five are we good 20 seconds to read 25 seconds to read 30 seconds to answer
Good morning, Prakash. You got time from office? All right, another five seconds and we'll start the timer. Good morning, Amruta. New to my class, but on time. I'm liking it. All right, anybody wants to answer? I'm so sorry. For me, there is, uh, I've forgotten the <laughs> days they are. <laughs> Anyways, it's good to see you here. Who else is there in the class? Amruta is there, Kaveri is there, Naveen is there, Prakash, Jairam, Sanjeev, Sivranjani, Kittur, Afreen. Who else is there? And what are the answers? Please answer in the live chat. Mm -hmm. Actually, guys, read again. Only Naveen got it correct. Prakash, read again. Good morning, Akash. Late by one question, but I can kind of tolerate that. All right. So, Prakash, did you read? It also speaks about gadgeted, the common eligibility test. No, Akash, it's not C. Afreen got it correct. Sanjeev got it correct. Naveen got it correct. Mangesh got it correct. It's A only. It is not for gadgeted post. It is only for non-gadgeted post. Are we good? Otherwise, then why do you have UPSC? UPSC is for gadgeted post, right? Then if there is a common eligibility test for all the gadgeted and the non-gadgeted post, why would you have UPSC? They are not scrapping off UPSC or Article 315 of Part 14 of the Constitution. That is where the services under the Union and the States come. Yes, missed it. That's why I keep saying, Prakash, I repeated it yesterday on the Unacademy session also. Read. Read as much as you can. It looks easy, but read. Everybody clear? Jairam, you're appearing for this year, right? Why C? This was recently in news. A. Everybody gets it? Sivranjini, you're correct. Sanjay, it's A, not B. All right. So, this recently was approved. They are setting up a national recruitment agency. So, up till now what happens is for different, different bank exams, different uh, exams to various governmental agencies which are non-gadgeted post. So, you have them for the entire year. In fact, um, I am reminded of a very funny thing. So, there was this one of my friends. For the entire year, whenever I used to ask him, he used to be preparing for some of the other exams, some very, very obscure exams about which I even hadn't heard. And I was like, and it's been happening for the past three, four years. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Get selected in one of those. And then he used to be like, uh, this time the interview for that one is going. Right now I'm writing the mains for this. And this is happening. That is happening. There's a clash in the exams. I used to be so confused. I was like, I'm only appearing for one exam that is civil services. And I kind of understand how it works. So uh, to actually curb all that confusion, they came up with a common eligibility test just like it is for CAT or the MBA exams, the common uh, admissions test. So in this, you will have a preliminary exam only. For example, the Indian Forest Services and the Indian Service, Civil Services exam is combined. But then the Indian Forest Services conducts its own mains and the Civil Services conducts its own mains. So similarly here, once the screening is done, the rest of the process is taken care of by the individual agencies who were supposed to be recruiting it. Right? Now, the entire National Recruitment Agency is, yes, it will be a society registered under the Society's Registration Act and they will move the exam online so that female candidates can appear, they don't have to travel. Rural candidates uh, find it easier to appear for the exam. And the plan here is that there will be a center in each of the 115 or 117 aspirational districts. Do you guys remember the program launched in 2018? about the transformation of aspirational districts. Mostly one or more than one district has been included from all the states of India. Yes? <laughs> yes, Prakash. Okay. So, uh, this National Recruitment Agency will be headed by the chairman who is of the rank of the secretary to the government of India. Does that ring a bell, Prakash and Jairam? 
we discussed it yesterday when i was talking about the pragati platform and i told you that without the secretaries or the union secretaries there will be no pragati because these are the people who are the union government these are the executives who actually run the programs of the ministers right so a person of that rank will be heading it and it will have representatives from railways because they conduct a lot of exams like rrb ministry of finance and department of financial services the ssc staff selection commission rrb and the ibps which conducts the bank exams so another uh, important thing about these exams will be why it is important now they will be conducted in 12 major languages of india so that's a major change because usually these exams are either in hindi and english so they leave out a considerable amount of people who can actually apply for these exams right so and the rules for the reservations will apply as they apply now question number 2 on your screens yes prakash three tier we did yesterday all right question number 2 on your screen uh, any doubts from the first question let me know question 2 is again very easy recently in news in august i think august 21 itself uh, mr arjun munda was launching this entire food project so it should be easy to go and your 30 seconds start now guys this should be easy i should have got the answers by now navin read again read again read again sivranjini and afreen have answered it correctly yes it's c actually navin why do you have confusion why not a let me know why not a akash why not uh, c yes neelam and you're late today also we are already done with question number 1 you said you won't be late uh sanjeev kaveri jairam prakash mangesh everybody is correct but the option a why why who those who actually gave me option b can you please give me the reason actually it is for the better utilization of minor forest produce what they are exactly doing is minor forest produce is there if you actually do some food processing you can increase your income so what they are saying is for example the berries that they pluck the bamboo that they pluck if you convert it into something more edible so for example if you go to the northeast you get bamboo ka pickle bamboo pickle so that's that's food processing done over bamboo so raw bamboo will not be that costly but bamboo pickle you can get it for considerable cost you can sell it over so that's what they are trying to do with the tri food project so pretty good initiative they have actually kind of put a seal on it otherwise uh, we are doing uh, processing of the minor food produced but actually having a dedicated project ded uh, dedicated to it really will work wonders for the uh, tribal people of india and yes it is a collaboration of ministry of food processing industry and ministry of tribal affairs launched very recently uh neelam have you subscribed to the channel then you will get the notification but you know the class happens you have been coming to my class for a while now 11 am sharp in the morning alternate days right neelam yes juhi you are right coming here this is directly from the news on air website so i've cover copied the entire text so that you can read it from here what they are trying to do is they are right now implementing it in two states chatisgarh and maharashtra so they said that the traditional tribal drink mahua amla custard apple jamun jamun or uh, blue blackberries i guess will be processed into juice and pulps and jams so that they can be sold out so one is in raigad maharashtra i want you guys to go after the class look for raigad on the map of india jagdalpur in chatisgarh will also be used for the processing of similar commodities so i want you guys to go and look for jagdalpur and raigad in maharashtra go and locate them on the maps it will improve your mapping skills you will know what what is where all right now i want to talk a briefly about minor forest produce there was a question in 2019 about minor forest produce so as per the indian forest act there is no definition of minor forest produce they only define forest produce right 
So in that they define timber, charcoal, uh, wood oil, resins, trees and leaves of flowers and fruits, plants not being trees, including reeds, moss, whatever which is edible, non-edible, wild animal skins, tusk horns or peat, surface soil, rocks and minerals all as forest produced. So forest produce is essentially that can be produced or got from the forest. It was only in 2006 when the Forest Rights Act came for the forest dwellers that minor forest produce was defined, right? So the FRA Act, it actually defines minor forest produce as all non-timber forest produce. That means apart from timber, which is used on a commercial scale of plant origin. So anything that comes from the plants, which is non-timber or timber means wood that can be used for commercial purposes includes bamboo there was a question in 2019 that is bamboo a minor forest produce yes it is brushwood stumps of trees canes that we usually use to uh, walk around with your dogs tusser cocoon honey waxes lac uh, tendu leaves which is very famous in chhattisgarh medicinal plants or left wing extreme estates herbs roots etc everything tubers and crops are a part of minor forest produce so that comes from your fra act 2006 and the entire forest produce is mentioned in Indian Forest Act 1927. Now, this entire thing I have taken from Vikaspedia. All right. So, I request you guys to keep a check on this website. It's a pretty good website, Vikaspedia and Earthpedia. Both are pretty good government sources, so you can rely on them. All right, Neelam, then you must be having a better idea. Good, uh, good morning, Krishna. Are you late to the class? Yes, you're late. Great. Knowing well that the class starts at 11, I don't want people to be late to the class. Okay. 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. This one is easy. So, I don't know. Aditya is not here. Though it's Sunday. He comes on all the weekdays and he's absent on Sunday. I don't know what happened. He's sleeping or what. So, Aditya, this I have taught in its entirety in my uh, science and technology course on an academy under the government initiative section. So if anybody has the PDF of that, who has the an academy plus subscription, please circulate it amongst your friends. The time starts now. Okay, this was a fairly easy one, right? <laughs> yes. So, Mangesh, Mangesh, where are you from? Are you from Maharashtra by any chance? And Sanjay, where are you from? All of you have answered it correctly. It was a pretty easy one. Yes, uh, only European countries can become members of this program. No, actually, uh, this entire program of accelerating CCS or carbon sequestration technologies or carbon storage technologies uh, is initially a part of mission innovation. Most of you must be already aware of it. It was started in 2016 and Department of Science and Technology participates in this mission innovation program in a big, big manner. Yes, Neelam, that's true. So, uh, Vaini, Obed, you are late to the class, which I don't like. Come on class on time, Obed, you already know the timings, right? Sanjay is from UP, all right. Uh, okay, Krishna, you are also answered it correctly. Okay, so yes, not only European countries, in fact, India is itself a member, so that's why. Yes, it is an international initiative to establish CO2 capture, utilization and storage. So, CCUS, capture, utilization and storage, all right. And act will be in action for a period of five years yes because it's to be st uh, itself established in 2016 to 2016 to 2021 20, uh, let's actually look at this so i will first show you the mission innovation website right because it is entirely derived from that so let's actually look at this so mission innovation if you go to their website was established in 2016 has 24 countries plus EU as its member, all right? So how they have established is that 
they have come up with eight innovation challenges the first seven were there i think in um, in the conference of parties meeting another one was added after 2 to 2 to 3 years this one the renewable and clean hydrogen wala thing the ic8 so under this under each one of these so as you can see innovation challenge 3 is for carbon capture you are from maharashtra right yes yes krishna don't be late it's a sunday don't keep sleeping at least not till the prelims then after prelims sleep as much as you want no no don't sleep after prelims also prepare for mains <laughs> all right so as you can see what they do under each of these challenges so countries identify which kind of challenge is very important for them so based on that a coalition of countries is formed and then they start helping each other in uh, coming out with better technologies to capture that kind of challenge now additionally um, uh if you really want to read about it it is there in the annual report of department of science and technology they have talked about mission innovation and what the work dst has done under this so this challenge especially the ic3 carbon capture challenge is one of those in which department of science and technology collaborates in a big way with the rest of the mission innovation countries so let's come back to act what is act or accelerating ccs carbon capture and storage technologies remember ccs carbon capture and storage so in case there is no full form written you should be knowing it right coming back uh, okay so under this there is transnational funding aimed at finding technologies which can help us for carbon capture five year period everybody knows all right uh initially this started with european members only but then since the objective was broad enough it changed from european to an international perspective so that's how it happened now now since 2018 act is open for all countries over the world with an interest in ccus that means carbon capture utilization and storage and the funding comes from canada denmark france germany greece india italy netherlands norway nordic region Romania space Switzerland Turkey UK and the USA so most of the european and uh, north american countries but asia is still lagging behind quite lagging behind we only have one great representation from asia that is india so uh, obviously that needs more funding from asia because we are the ones we will be greatly affected by the entire carbon sequestration technologies so let's move forward this is the portal picture go and visit the portal go and visit each of these goals you can utilize it in your mains answer also very good program excellent program and completely aligns with the sustainable development goals that are supposed to be achieved by 2030 i will prakash i'll do that uh, geography crash course na i'll do that prakash uh, in fact i think i'll cover the mapping part at least before august itself uh, india map and world map i will cover before the uh, august itself i'll do that okay Question number four on your screens, very easy, right? It was recently in news, so twenty seconds to read and thirty seconds to answer. All right, Krishna. All right. I'm sorry, I scolded you. Best of luck. All right. <laughs> my God, my students are so sincere. All right. All right your time starts now So somebody wants to answer this Why actually uh, sanjay has answered it correctly obit are you following the others and prakash why see i know kvic looks a little off beat but um, sanjay has answered it correctly actually it is d so up bihar guys pretty good 
Yes, KVIC is actually the nodal agency for the Pradhan Mantri Employment Generation Program. Yes, any individual above 18 years can apply for the scheme and yes, there is no income ceiling for setting up of projects, right? Yes, all you think. You are thinking correct, Neelam. NOP is what? Uh, sorry, Obed, I don't understand NOP. So basically, it was recently news that uh, there has been a boost in the number of projects that have been sanctioned under the P Prime Minister's Employment Generation Program. Yes, it is headed by KVIC, which seems quite offbeat even to me. And assistance under the scheme for employment generation is available only to new units, not the existing units. What are they trying to exactly do is to boost entrepreneurial spirits. See, they are saying no income ceiling for setting up of projects, but what they do is whenever a bank is giving out you loan, they will automatically check for the feasibility of the project. So if it looks like a very good project, then they will definitely invest it. That's why there's no income ceiling. Okay, Prakash. Uh, Obed, can you please tell me what is NOP? Yes, Juhi, you're right. It's D. All right. Let's move on to question number five. This Prakash, Jairam, all those who have been coming regularly to the class, Naveen also, because we have already discussed this, should get it correct. Sivranjini, you too. So, I am starting your time right now. All right, so somebody is answering it. Uh, Prakash, answering your question, yes, you're right, it is by the MSME ministry. All right, but the thing is that MSME is kind of the nodal ministry. It is being implemented by the KVIC in all the states. Is that distinction clear? The nodal agency is MSME or what you can say the, the ministry that actually regulates the entire thing. But the nodal agency for implementation is KVIC. Is that clear now? Yes, Neelam, you're right. Okay, so, oh, okay, which of the following is are correct? Actually, uh, only Juhi is correct here. So, it is neither a world heritage site, no, and nor is it a temple dedicated to sun god. So, the correct answer is D. Am I clear? It looks like the Lingaraj temple should be a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it surprisingly is not. In fact, the question is how to make it into a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which we will just discuss. However, the Sun, the Konark Temple, the temple in Konark, the Sun Temple of Konark is a UNESCO Heritage Site. That temple is a UNESCO Heritage Site, but Lingaraj Temple is not. And it is one of the most famous examples of Kalinga architecture or Nagar architecture, Nagar temple architecture, right? So, I don't know if you guys remember, I had in one of the unacademy sessions discussed the similarities in the architecture of the Lingaraj temple, the temple that will be built in Ayodhya and the Lakshmi Narayan temple, which is a very famous temple in Jaipur itself. The architecture looks stunningly similar, uncannily similar. So, that was, I was telling my students that you know, 11th century temple, Lingaraj temple, coming to the 20th century temples, the architecture designs haven't changed much. Are we clear? Yes, Sanjay, it is for Shiva only. In fact, it is, uh, yes, so many are late. All right, Obed, Obed. Now, Neelam is like, ma'am, I remember, I remember now. <laughs> All right. Yes, Obed, it is in Odisha. Uh, yes, Himanshu Lingaraj temple for Shiva. In fact, it is considered to be a Swambhu Shivling. What that means is something which has come up on its own. So, it's a very, very famous temple, the Lingaraj temple. How many of you know 
that Bhubaneswar is actually called Ekamra. Anyone from um, Odisha? <laughs> All right, Neelam. Anyone from Odisha here? Okay. You visited the Lingaraj temple. I actually want to visit the Lingaraj temple. I have like so much affinity for this kind of architecture. Any which ways. So, uh, Bhuvaneshwar in some ancient text is actually called Ekamra, which means a uh, single mango tree in a forest. I don't know what why exactly they have called it that way. So, the old city of Bhuvaneshwar or the temple city of Bhuvaneshwar, you have the Ekamra tour. Prakash must be knowing about it if you have visited it. Himanshu. All right, Obed. You know Juhi? Great. All right. So, S2S, can you please tell me your name so that I can actually talk to you here? So, if you have visited, so what they are now doing is they are trying to restore it to its pre-350 year structural status so that their chances of getting listed under the UNESCO heritage site will become stronger, right? So, it is not under the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Agreed? Now, they are working through it that we will in and you know this is despite the fact that the Odisha government is trapped for funds but they really want to do it. Now something more about Lingaraj temple is built on the Nagar style of architecture very famous example of Nagar style of architecture. The temple is approximately 180 feet and high. Kalinga style of architecture is similar to this just some additional elements and uh, it was built in the 11th century AD by the Somanshi king Yayati I. So remember the names also here. That's what I wanted to show you. Uh, should we move on to the next part? And Ekamra Shetra is known as the entire tour that is given to you of various temples. I don't have the photos here. I think I forgot to attach them. I had uh, wanted to be pasting them, but I think I somehow forgot them. I will show it to you in the next class first thing. All the temples which are part of it, the Raja Rani temple, the Bindusar tank is also there. So what they are trying to do under this entire plan is, they are trying to remove the barrier between the Lingaraj temple and the Bindusar tank. So they are saying, uh, 400 years back, there was no barrier in visiting all the nearby temples. And in fact, Bhuvneshwar, I think, is a group of 7,000 ancient temples. Now very few remain. So the plan is to revive as much as they can. Sudipto, yes, you're late. All right. <laughs> okay, Prakash. So, UPSC nahi kar rahe the. Yes, Neelam. Raja Rani, Bindusar tank and there is one more. I'm forgetting the name. I will show all of those temples to you uh, in the next session. That is on 25th August. I will show it to you. So, don't worry. We'll see all those temples. We'll also see their architecture in a little bit detail. Okay, Krishna, right now, please don't uh, spam the group here, alright? If anybody wants to do, they will go there, but don't spam my groups and don't spam the chats. If we are doing something here, focus on that. So, please retract your message. Alright, we'll start with the next session. That's quick 10. And... Let's start. So, I'll give you 15 to 20 se uh, seconds to attempt questions here and 30 seconds to answer. All right, Radhima, that I didn't know. But actually, thanks for that historical fact. I'll just cross check it. Are you very sure, Radhima? Are you from Odisha by any chance? Then you must be knowing it better than I do. Alright, your time starts now. This is an interesting question. So, we will do it in a little bit more detail. Juhi, you want to read that again? Anybody who wants to read that again and then attempt it again? Nobody wants to do that. 
Actually, all right, all right, Radhima. Uh, only Jairam is correct, Prakash is correct, and Suman is correct. The answer is option number A. Odisha, no. MP, yes. MP has the maximum number of ghadiyals greater than 1000. Sorry, 1000. In fact, yes, ghadiyal prefer deep, fast flowing rivers. This is correct. They also prefer some shallow regions, so we'll discuss that. And yes, Gharial populations are present in Girwa, Son, Ramganga, Chambal and Mahanadi river. Chambal, Mahanadi and Son we have already discussed in our sessions. Ramganga and Girwa, I want you guys to find out on the map. If you're not able to find it out, I will show it to you on the map. Maybe in the 25th August session, we'll discuss the temples and the uh, rivers also. So we'll do that. All right. And MP, after securing the tag for the Tiger Reserves, has also secured the tag for being India's Ghadiyal state. So, let's see how. It's okay, Juhi. It's okay. Obit, it's A. Alright? You knew the name of the state. It's okay, Sanjay. Uh, you are from UP, right, Sanjay? Himanshu, you are also from UP, if I'm not wrong? Yes, Chambal flows an MP. In fact, I remember, oh yes, that brings a very, very fond memory. So, uh, while I was studying for in my undergrad, we were taken to the Kota, the Ravad Bhata, plant, Ravad Bhata flower plant. So, obviously, we were students then. So, seeing the Chambal River, it was very beautiful. The power plant was located in a very picturesque location. So, seeing the beautiful river flowing, Chambal was flowing in all its glory. We decided to take off our clothes and go and swim in the river. And that was very near to the barrage. Right? So, Ghadiyal and crocodile are two different things, Mangesh. Ghadiyal is different from the crocodile because of the bulbous knob that comes out. So, that's why they are different. But yes, they are a subspecies. Okay, Sanjay. So, we were there. We wanted to take off our clothes and go inside. And that was very near to the barrage where the gates open for the dam. So... As soon as half of the students were inside and I was also about to take my clothes off and go inside, uh, the people from the power plant, they came running and they were like, are you guys mad? First of all, you can find ghadiyals in there, in that river. All right. So you'll be eaten alive. Don't even dare. And yes, Akash. And the second thing was, if the floodgates open, we wouldn't be able to even recover your body. So if you ever want to swim... Please let us know. We'll take you at that place. Don't just go inside the river. It's, it, it looks very calm and composed. It looks, it, it's very shallow near the shores. But it is a very dangerous river. So I remember that very, very clearly. And from there, you can also see the ravines of Chambal. Alright. So coming back. Yes. So this thing was actually declared, I think, in February. It was in uh, Indian Express, right? So, after being declared that there were highest number of tigers in Madhya Pradesh, now approximately 1200 Ghadiyal population is there in MP, followed by Bihar. So, as per the WTI survey report, what is WTI? Wildlife Trust of India. There are approximately um, 1255 Ghadiyals in Chambal River in Madhya Pradesh itself, right? Now, coming here, uh, what are their characteristics? So, they do prefer deep, fast-flowing rivers. So, Chambal was looking very shallow to us, but it is deep. And they uh, are also observed in still water br branches. I don't know. So, in Northeast also, we visited some jheel. I think it's the Badapani jheel when you go on your way to um, Shillong. So, they told us that there are crocodiles or ghadiyals in that river, uh, in that jheel also. But I think they were crocodiles, not ghadiyals. That's what we were told. So, as much as I wanted to take a bath in that also, I had to come out. Then, uh, usually gharyals are found in the river system in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and southern part of Bhutan and Nepal. However, as of now, they are only found in India and Nepal. So, that's why they have been accorded the highest protection in the Wildlife Protection Act, that is Schedule 1. So, guys who are from Unacademy, you have attended the classes. Yes, Neelam. Uh, I know, Prakash. Uh, I have saved myself from drowning in, I don't know, five different rivers and five different ponds. So, I keep jumping into water only to come out realizing I shouldn't. Uh... Neelam, I think it is Shillong. On the way to Shillong, there comes Badapani. 
I think it comes on the way to Shillong, Meghale. So that's Meghale only, right? Shillong is the capital of Meghale, if I'm not wrong. Not Arunachal Pradesh. Bada Pani is not an Arunachal Pradesh because I did not go to Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, we couldn't go to Arunachal Pradesh because it had started snowing there. That's why I remember. Any which ways. Coming back, yes, it is critically endangered on the IUCN red list. Guys, do you remember the demarcations on the IUCN red list? I already discussed it in the Unacademy sessions. I'm repeating it here so that you will remember it for the, your entire remaining life. We start with extinct in the wild, EW, followed by, ex, uh, sorry, we, we start with extinct, that means nowhere to be found, followed by extinct in the wild, that means only captivity breeding, these species can be found. Then we start with the threatened category. In the threatened category, there are three things, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable, right? So... Do you guys remember we discussed vulnerable for what one? Hornbills we discussed vulnerable, right? We had discussed that entire thing for great hornbills, the state animal of Arunachal. <laughs> okay, Obed remembers it. Yes, Tawang. Tawang is very famous, but yeah, that, that started snowing then. Okay, so coming here. Sivranjani, three types of what are found in India? Ah, even I have photos of Bada Pani. It's a beautiful, beautiful pond. Anyways, vulnerable and these all three are categories of threatened. Then you have near threatened and then you have least concerned and then you have data not found. Right? So, we are not concerned with data not found. Under the threatened category, it comes under the critically endangered category. So, that's the highest level of red alert in the IUCN apart from the extinct and wild and extinct categories. Are we good? Yes, Akash, it is in Meghalaya. Sanjeev, what is in Kerala? The ghadiyals or the crocodiles? Crocodiles, I think I have found at a lot of places. Even in Jaipur Zoo, they are found. In fact, uh, I have another experience from here. So, I think in the 1980s, there was a flood in Rajasthan. And my school is on, it's very near to the zoo, Jaipur Zoo. So, they said during the flood times, the crocodiles had entered the zoo, uh, entered the school. So, it's very still very much fondly remember we never had that kind of flood here. Yes, Sanjeev, uh, it's the state animal of Kerala also. Thanks, Simrajani. I'll take that into account. Thank you. Himanshu, Cheetah and Karnataka are in what? I don't remember, but it should be critically endangered or it should be extinct and wild. It should be extinct in wild Himanshu. If they are being bred in captivity, then extinct in wild. Actually, they are extinct in wild Himanshu. Uh, that's the correct category. They are extinct in wild. We are now getting it back. They are already extinct in India. We are now trying to get it back. Is that clear? All right. So, all the links are provided here. You can go check WWF India and you can go and check this Indian Express article. All right. Uh, the rivers, I want you guys to go. Look for these rivers, Girwa, which is in Uttar Pradesh, Sanjay must be knowing about it, Son, Madhya Pradesh, so the Rehan project is also on Son, Ramganga, Uttarakhand, I have seen this river, Gandak river Bihar, Chambal, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan, I have seen, Mahanadi, I haven't seen. Yes, Sivranjani, I did Sanjeev and I am back to that. Yes, Neelam, we will we'll just go through that, wait for a second, alright? Chalo, this one is easy. So, 20 seconds to read. No, you don't require time to read. I'll directly start with read and answer. So, time starts now. Neelam, I'm not understanding. Umiyam, Lake, Badapani, what do you mean by Umiyam? Is that what it is locally called, is it? Anybody wants to answer? Hmm. Jairam has answered. Himanshu has answered. Prakash, we need to work more on the wildlife century national park thingy. 
Obed, we need to work more on that. Sanjeev, we need to work more on that. That's why I keep doing questions regularly. Veni, we need to work more on that. Blackbuck looks like it should belong to Rajasthan. Good morning, Ronnie. You're half late to my class. We're we'll all be on question number seven. Don't be late. Suman, Afreen, Kaveri, we all need to work. Sivranjani, you are correct. So, two and three are correct. Blackbuck National Park is actually in Gujarat. In fact, it was made in 1970s, 19, late 1970s or 1980s, early 1980s. So, this park is in Gujarat. Balpakaram uh, and Anshi National Park are correctly matched. Anshi is in Karnataka, pretty famous national park from Karnataka. And Meghalay, I couldn't visit this, but I think it is in the Garo Hills, if I'm not wrong. Akash and Neelam, it is in the Garo Hills, right? Sorry, which bhai ne fesla diya hai? Um, <laughs> yes, Prakash, you're right. Okay, so Naveen, it's not D. Not all of them are correct. Kaveri, you also. Afreen, Suman. Guys, I show you this daily. Roni, what is your answer? Or you're not answering? You'll be answering from the next question. So let's take a look at this map. All right. Let's zoom in and see. So there it is, your Bal Fakram or Bal Pakram National Park in Meghalaya. Are we clear? Very clear, very close to Nokrek Ridge or Nokrek National Park in Meghalaya. Also remember the Cable Lamjao National Park. So people from the Northeast must already be knowing about it, right? Now maybe we have already discussed. We also discussed one more here. Do you guys remember Pakke Tiger Reserve? We discuss, we discussed in the uh, day before yesterday's class. Salman Bhai. Yes, Prakash, you're right. All right, away. That's called the Reboy District. All right. Oh, I have a lot of people from Northeast today. Pretty good. Okay, guys. So, we also discussed that Puke uh, Tiger Reserve. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the Papam Forest Reserve, which was in news recently regarding the hornbills. So, they are both very closely uh, located to Nameri. So, the Pukke Tiger Reserve is in uh, this Arunachal Pradesh, just on top of Nameri. So, Nameri is at the border of uh, Assam and Arunachal. All right. Coming here, let's come down a little bit. So, you have the Anshi National Park here at the Karnataka uh, Goa border. Can you see it here? Yes, Neelam, Arunachal. I'm right. Garo Hills, right? Okay. And then let's look at the Black Buck. So, Prakash, your Salman Bhai did not come to Gujarat. He came to Rajasthan. I think um, it was in Jodhpur. Yes, very, very close to my maternal grand home. Uh, this is the Blackbuck National Park at the Gulf of Cambay. Can you see it here, Prakash? Still here? So, we'll keep looking at this daily. We've already talked about a lot of them. I, I think I've covered a couple of them in the northern part. We did Simbal Bada yesterday. Do you guys remember? Simbal Bada, Kale Sir, we've already done them. So I'll keep doing them as and when we progress. So we'll cover this entire map. Next question on your screens. All right. Your time starts now. So we'll cover uh, thermal power plants and wildlife centuries by I think in the next two, three days and then we'll move on to the next map. Yes, Krishna, it's a very, very famous uh, national park in Karnataka. You're right. I am feel so bad that I can't visit most of these places. Uh, because I'm actually scared of wildlife. I am very scared. But I'll need to gather more courage if I want to visit these places. Okay. So anybody wants to answer this? Yes, yes. I can't make the maps. Yaar. Come on, I can't make these kind of maps. You can go and check the maps. Yes, Akash, Bongai Gaon is the oldest refinery in India. So, anybody wants to answer? Which is incorrect, which is correct? All right. Sanjeev is, I skipped it, ma'am. All right. There is option number E. What the hell? I don't know the answer. All right. Uh, yes, I'm asking for E. Incorrect ones. Actually, the answer is D. 
so only afreen prakash read properly i've been saying that for a while and it's not a one and two are not correct neelam incorrect so only one person in the entire class has answered it correctly it's afreen she's been reading the questions correctly and she's been answering correctly pretty good afreen in fact i think you featured in the leaderboard day before yesterday right afreen now neelam remembers she's like yes ma'am d d d okay jairam you're right it's d so let's do it bongai gaon obviously a sam in fact there is a very interesting story about it which akash and neelam will be able to add to jharsu goda very famous uranium mine they are in odisha all right simhadri is in ap vishakhapatnam not telangana so pretty close but not there all right so let's actually go and check hence the correct answer is d sorry first what diya hu uh neelam afreen answered before you way before you yes veni oh okay let's actually check these out so coming here this is your bongai gaon very close to the border with this i think meghalaya not very close but yes uh i think it is on it is very close to the river brahmaputra is it akash if i'm not wrong because uh, the interesting story about bongai gaon is this thermal plant was actually closed up because it wasn't producing up to the optimum levels so very recently the ntpc has revived it now and uh, it's a 750 megawatt power plant so the last last batch of the 250 megawatt was actually uh, commissioned in 2019 march yes so this is bongai gaon for you let's come to uh, what others do we had mm, what were the other two that we wanted to discuss i forgotten the name only okay uh, yes one in telangana and here so simhadri here is at vishakhapatnam so it takes its water from the eluru canal on godavari so godavari provides water to the simhadri power plant so go and locate godavari on the map go and locate the eluru canal on the map Now let's come to Jharsu Goda. As you can see, it's in Odisha, border of Odisha yeah. and Chhattisgarh. All right. So Jharsu Goda, everybody knows, very famous for the uranium mines. Do we remember that? So this is Jharsu Goda here for you. All right. So it takes water from I think Mahanadi only. I don't exactly remember which is the canal here. Let me just check. So yes, it takes it from the Hirakud Dam. It's pretty clear, uh, close to the Hirakud Dam, and it is operated by uh, the Sterlite Energy. And in fact, uh, interestingly, the entire project to construct this dam was given to People's Republic of China. So pretty ironical, but they are actually doing it. And you'll be amazed to know that I worked with Sterlite Power. So their headquarters is in Delhi, I guess. and we worked on a very interesting hr project with them we made their entire kras and kpis in a week and we actually took a hell lot of good money from them for that any which ways and okay so now the bongai gaon is also called the kokrajhar project in assam it's for 750 megawatts the simhadri or the vishakhapatnam is for 2000 megawatts you need not remember but they are all very large projects and the one in the odisha is for 2400 megawatts and all of the three are coal fired projects uh yes afreen simhadri and saloni yes you right so saloni you are new to my class right a lot of people are new here all right next question on your screens 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer prakash are you alive or have i lost you Your time will start in another five seconds. Your time starts now. All right. Already answered. 
Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Pretty good. It's your first class, Sal Saloni. I know. I haven't seen you earlier. So come on time, Saloni, from the next time onwards. The next class is on 25th August. The class happens at 11 a.m. in the morning. Alternative days till the prelims are here. So it's a prelims test series. All right. Everybody got it correct? Akash, when everybody is saying C, sometimes go with the public opinion, right? It is not always wrong. Most of the time, public opinion is right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, being human, pro-human is also here. His age is 32. It is not led by Department of Biotechnology. In fact, two or three departments are linked here. We'll discuss that. Yes, it is a research on indigenous cows. Basically, the panjgavyas or the five products that we actually get from cow. Uh, your milk, curd, your uh, this butter or ghee and your uh, I think paneer also is there. I don't know what the other fifth product is. So all the primary milk and milk products that you get from cow are a part of this. Urine also. Sorry, the fifth product is urine. So they or the program also aims to develop standards for traditionally processed dairy products of Indian origin cows. So how to standardize it so that we can sell it in the international market and also increase its uh, demand domestically. So let's come here. So uh, this is led by, it is led by Department of Biotechnology, CSIR and Ministry of Ayush. So all three and fourth is Indian Council of Medical Research. So four people are there which are leading the project and Sutrapik essentially uh, the full form is scientific utilization through research augmentation. So you don't really have to bother about the name because they have just put the word somewhere there just to form something. Uh, the entire meaning does not come out perfectly. There's no meaning attached to it. So prime products from indigenous cows. So the only the pick makes sense by prime products from indigenous cows. So coming back, this program was actually uh, launched in February 2020 and there are five themes to the programs that you should know. So uniqueness of the indigenous cows, what do they bring to the table for medicine and health, for agriculture, for food and nutrition and for their utility items. So the panchakavyas that I already talked about. Now, uh, this initially it was announced in the 2019-20 budget. If you remember the indigenous cattle, there will be a research program on the indigenous cattle. It was announced in the 2019-20 budget and finally took part in February 20. So, the aim is to actually research on the milk and milk products derived from indigenous cows, understand the nutritional and therapeutic properties of curd and ghee prepared from indigenous breed of cows. In fact, I'll tell you interesting. So, we actually started to get some organic ghee from cows, the Indian cow, cow breed only and the ghee is pretty good. In fact, most of that ghee is usually in yellow color, very dark yellow color and the ghee really tastes pretty good. I don't know about the curd but the ghee really tastes very good. So it was there also in the Hindu. Now the Panchagavyas, please remember their names, milk, curd, ghee, dung and urine, not paneer, sorry it's a derivative. So, this was there in the Hindu. You can go and check the article out. Not led by which department? It's actually a combination of all these departments leading it. So, there might be a head, someone from one of these uh, departments who I might be heading the project, but not led by any department. It's a combination of these four departments working together. Are we good? All right. So, there is no DST Prakash. It's only Department of Biology, Biotechnology. No DST involved. Alright, next question, 20 seconds to answer and 30 seconds, 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. This should be pretty easy. All right, the time starts now. Wow. 
वाई नॉट डी रोनी नवीन इज आस्किंग मी मैम इज सी करेक्ट ऑल राइट सो मोस्ट ऑफ यू हैव आंसर इट करेक्टली आकाश एंड नवीन सी इज इन करेक्ट सी इज नॉट करेक्ट एक्चुअली ओनली बी इज इन करेक्ट दिस इज वेरी ऑब्वियस आई आई पी इज फॉर इंडस्ट्रियल प्रोडक्ट इंडेक्स ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल प्रोडक्शन सो डेफिनेटली मैनुफैक्चरिंग विल बी देर एंड द परसेंटेज गिवन टू मैनुफैक्चरिंग एक्टिविटी will definitely be higher than electricity so it's based on the uh, amount of activity or the volume of activity that is being done so option number 2 is incorrect one is correct and three is correct all right so one and three is the correct answer all right so let's actually look at this sivranjani it's d actually one and three so most of you got it correct prakash i haven't received an answer from you have you slept off All right, Roni. Mangesh, are we clear? Are you understanding, Mangesh and Veni? Is everybody clear? Are we guys enjoying the class? Uh, but more than that, are we getting information out of it? So that's important. So coming here, let's actually track it. So why was this entire thing? Why are we even discussing the IIP? So somewhere in November, I think November, December, our uh, Finance Minister Ms. Sita Raman, she talked about that we are seeing green shoots in the economy. That's why I have quoted this article here from Indian Express, right? So she was talking about the green shoots in economy because in November 19, for the first time, the IIP showed an expansion. At least it was not showing contraction. That means manufacturing activities were picking up. So it has been refuted later on. Great, Vani. Great, great, great. so it has been later refuted because in december the iip again contracted so that means the economy was actually not doing well so what she was saying that we are starting to see green shoots in the economy is not exactly happening so that's when indian express decided to explain the entire iip so what is exactly happening coming here there are two ways actually to decipher the iip data index of industrial production data can anybody tell me who releases it under mospi we have discussed this in detail do you guys remember who releases the uh, index the cpi for agriculture workers and rural workers do you guys remember that rural laborers who releases the cpi during which time i explained you the structure of mospi so that you now remember who releases the iip Does anybody wants to answer that? Do you guys remember? We have already discussed that in detail, and I discussed this in the previous or uh, I think uh, one or two sessions ago on the YouTube session itself. So Mospi has two wings. One is the statistics wing, under which comes your central statistics office. So the central statistics office releases your IIP data, and the another one is the program implement implementation wing, under which comes your MP LAD division, about which I also revised yesterday. Yes. So, who releases the rural one? Who releases the rural CPI? Is it done by the CSO? No. Okay, Akash is right. Yes, it's done by the Labour Bureau. Remember, Akash? You remember that question? We discussed it. Okay. So, what they are saying is the IIP data can be looked at in two ways. One is the sectoral one. sectoral means industry is divided into three sectors manufacturing mining and electricity these are the three primary production indices so manufacturing is given the highest weightage of 77% or approximately 78% mining is second with 14% share and uh, your that makes it i think what uh, 87 and 4 approximately 92% is covered by mining and manufacturing the last 8% is covered by electricity so electricity has the least may, uh, weight yes himanshu uh, yes akash yes mangesh uh, sivranjani what happened no you don't remember akash why did you retract you were right it's labor bureau you were absolutely right all right so that is one classification there is another classification that is based on the consumer durability of each of the sectors what does that mean that the kinds of goods are produced because that becomes use based classification what kind of goods are used 
So then the data is provided in six categories, primary goods, mining, electricity, fuels, which about without which you can, cannot survive, capital goods, machinery items, intermediate goods, for example, before making a cloth, you need to have a yarn or, or chemicals, uh, the APIs are intermediary goods, semi-finished steel items, right? Infrastructure goods, paint, cement, cables, consumer durables, telephones, ACs, etc. Consumer non-durables. So that is food items. All the FMCG products are a part of consumer non-durables. Now, in that, your primary goods has the highest weightage. Your intermediate goods have the second highest weightage at 17%. You don't need to remember the weightages. What I want you to understand here is the most important point which is important to your understanding is that as per economist, as per various think tanks, it's the intermediate goods that make the most difference. So if you really want to track IIP and if you really want to know how the production is going on, yes, Akash, I know. Simranjani remembers, yes, yes, you only said labor. So you're right, Akash, I, I take that in. So considering this, the observers say that if you really want to know how our economy is doing, look at the intermediate goods. If there are more intermediate goods being produced, then sooner or later the economy will be back on track. Because if these goods are being produced, that means they will be utilized as the final outcomes or they have been produced for the final outcomes. However, if there is a contraction in the production of intermediate goods, then it means that there is a contraction in the economy and sooner or later the economy is going to contract. So that's one of the best indicators to look at whether the industrial production will pick up or not. So that's how you actually indicate green shoots in the economy. Remember this point, utilize this point if you're writing an essay or if you're writing any answer under the economics case in GS3. Are we good? This was a pretty interesting article. So if you want, please go and check the Indian Express article on explained why has industrial uh, production contracted in December and what does it mean for Indian economy? All right, this question, Akash, Neelam, all the people from Northeast should get it correct. Obeda, are you still here? If you're still here, then you should answer it correctly. Prakash, are you still here? Okay, so 15 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. All right, your time starts now. I am remembering somebody here. I think Sujan or Amit from my An Academy class. They are both from Northeast, and Sangai is also known as the dancing beer. All right. Jairam, do you want to read again? Neelam, stop making comments. Just answer. When I'm asking you to answer, just answer. We'll do the comments later. All right? Because then you disturb the entire class. So don't do that. When you are asked to answer, just answer A, B, C, D. We'll discuss. When we discuss, then give your comments. All right? All right. So somebody called Galaxy Milky Way is also here. Nice to see you. Yes, uh, most of you are actually correct. Sivranjani and Sanji, why A? In all the land, why A? And who else has answered D? Jairam, do you want to reconsider? Hima, Himanshu, you want to reconsider? Uh, Prakash, do you want to reconsider? No, Mr. Being Human, it is not D. Um, all right. The correct answer is actually 2 and 3. So, yes, because of the uniqueness of this entire vegetation that grows there, organic vegetation, which is in certain states of DK, they come together to form a floating freshwater, uh, to form a floating uh, vegetation kind of stuff. That only happens in the Cable Lamjao Park that is located here. Loktuk is the largest freshwater lake, but in northeast, not in India. 
which is the largest freshwater lake in India? Any idea? Wooler Lake. Do you re guys remember? It's the largest, I think, freshwater lake in Asia. Yes, Jairam. Don't do that, Neelam, because then everybody else gets distracted, right? So don't do that. You can uh, comment as much as you want when I'm discussing. I will take in your comments. But when the people are attempting the questions, then they get distracted, right? Okay. And yes, it's the last natural refuge of the endangered. Sangai is called the dancing deer. And do you know why it is called dancing? It is called dancing because it actually travels on these floating vegetation. So it appears as if this deer is dancing. I really want to see that how it actually looks like. But even imagining it and I was actually looking at the pictures in the morning. It's beautiful. Uh, in fact... <laughs> All right. Um, all right, Komal. All right. Yes, Sivranjani, you're right. Dancing, dear Sivranjani, I know. Very good. Float, yes. Wooler Lake in Kashmir. Okay. So, this actually, this entire question, you'll be like, ma'am, it's a static question. No, it is not. There was an entire article on it in the Hindu, in the science and tech. So, interestingly, do you guys remember, we discussed some of the dams in a couple of classes, we discussed some of the thermal power projects drawing water. So, on the Loktak Lake, another thermal power project was set up in the 1970s, some 50 years back. So, I think it's on the, I think Bhuga rivers, that's one of the rivers, Bhuga and Manipur rivers. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Bhuga is there and Manipur river is there. And they have built a barrage uh, at the Ichai point. I uh, uh, Sorry for the spellings, but I don't remember the spellings clearly. So they have built a hydropower project there. So because of that, the entire ecosystem of Loktak Lake has been disrupted. So this entire article in the Hindu was about that only. That it's a very, very delicate ecosystem there. And uh, interestingly, they have been trying to recover the fishing population in Loktak. So originally, a lot of fish used to flow in from Myanmar, from the Irrawaddy rivers and the other places. But after the dam has been built, the fish population has considerably declined. So a lot of problem is going on in that area. And this entire article is about that. So if it is possible for you guys, please go and read about it. It's a beautifully written article which actually describes how the entire ecosystem of Loktak Lake works, what are FOMDs exactly, they have explained it. And I will show you the picture. So I, now I remember there are three pictures that I need to show you. So we'll do all of that in the next session. The first thing in the morning when we start, we'll go back and discuss those pictures and the maps which are important, all right? Okay, so are we clear? And this site... Ha, is now a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention and it was it has become a wetland way ahead uh, way before in March 1990 itself and it is also in the Montreux record it's a city in France all right uh, so it is one of those Ramsar sites whose ecological character is keep on changing so as I just told you because of the barrage being built the entire ecosystem has gone for a revamp so the fumdis that are formed are no longer very um, convenient or the fishing population has declined and the fumdis keep drifting from here and there and the entire... So originally there was a wetland near to Loktak Lake and there was a Loktak Lake. So originally they were separated in the heydays. Now the Loktak Lake and the wetlands have become one place. That's what the entire article suggests. So that's because of the dam that has been built. <laughs> yes, you should be afraid. You should know your area well because that is very important for the interviews also, Akash. And if you're not knowing your own area well, I, actually, I'm at fault also. I might not know everything about Rajasthan, but that's okay. So we learn together. All right. Okay. Uh, this is a repeat question and now everybody should get it correct. That day, a lot of people got it incorrect. So if you have been attending classes regularly, you already know the answer for it. And Prakash, this includes you. You cannot get this one incorrect. And Jairam also. Jairam already got it correct. All right. All 
All right, today everybody got it correct. That day, so many of you couldn't get it correct. Most of you were like, it is European Union, it is Africa, it is something, something, something. Okay, so yes, the answer is South America. Pretty much news. Now it's kind of uh, semi functional. So the countries here are Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina. All right. Paraguay, Uruguay. We discussed that that day, remember? <laughs> All right, you'll be back on the moon, Prakash, no time. Yes, Imanshi, you're correct. So let's move on to the next one. That day also I had told you guys, how many of you have made that table? I told you trade block, countries, established in year, aim or functional or not or recent issues related to them. Make a table like this for all the major trade blocks. It will really help you out. Then you can use that information anywhere you want. Right? Guys, understand one thing. The entire exam is about knowledge and information. So it might not particularly help you in solving questions. No. Or even writing answers. No. But what it will help you in is eliminating the incorrect options at least in the prelims and when it comes to mains if you really have all this kind of knowledge then you can formulate the best of the answers if you're able to utilize your knowledge properly so we'll have another course on answer writing where i will teach you how to link all these knowledge that you already have so you don't have to study anything extra by only knowing what we know we can write very good answers but for that i want you guys to work with me is that clear okay so let's move on to the next question. Question number 13. Fifteen seconds to read because it's quick 10 section and 30 seconds to answer. This is also a very interesting question. So we'll discuss this a little bit great in detail. It's a very, very interesting question. Your time starts now. Guys, do you want to reconsider? Anybody wants to reconsider their answers? Only Galaxy Milky Way has answered it correctly. She knows about, he or she knows about the universe. Can I please have your name please? Because only you have answered it correctly. Afreen, maybe the... What are we doing here? Playing KBC, KBC, 50-50, phone of friend. I don't know. I go for C. <laughs> All right, we'll discuss that. It's B actually. Sivranjani is correct. And uh, that galaxy Milky Way girl or boy, whoever it is, he's correct. So conservation of migratory species of wildlife animals is under UNEP. This is correct. Now let's talk about Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. Okay, so Viju, Viju, whoever you are, can I know your name? Now Neelam Kalita is okay B. Ma'am, if you're saying so, I'll make it B. I don't believe in this. Whatever the newspaper might say, my answer is something else. Yes, sites is for trade. All right, and that is for trade in endangered species. Is that clear, Jairam? Now there will be no, uh, no uh, doubts. That's for trade in endangered species. So your tiger, etc. And the uh, Jairam, you weren't there in that session. In one of my unacademy sessions, I discussed about the red boa constrictor, the red sand boa, not the red boa constrictor, the red sand boa. Prakash, do you remember that class? Okay, you're Vijay. So 
that's actually called a two faced snake so the international price for it is approximately 1.5 to 2 crores so i discussed that along with a couple of other sites uh, species so are we good okay so jairam you can go and look at those sessions it's one of those special sessions only however there are a lot of special sessions now so take out the pdf and go through the pdf so i've explained it in detail all right so this is different this is conservation of migratory species why uh because there are a lot of species which have entire country ranges they are not found in one country they actually have movement from one country to another so that's what is covered under the conservation of migratory species the very famous example is the keola dev national parks where you have the siberian sorry the pink flamingos coming in yes cop 13 nilam remember okay so how to do this question correct even if you had no information prakash jairam all those who are appearing for upsc 2020 now listen very carefully so even if you didn't know it do you guys remember in the wildlife act protection act 1972 we have six schedules we did that prakash and jairam you were there in both those classes sanjeev you were also there remember i free i think you were also there Yes, Nila, it's in Rajasthan. I have been there for a lot of times. Are you guys here? Or slept off? Only Nilam replies to me. I don't know. The guys don't listen at all. Any which ways. So even in that, the Schedule One is for the most protected species, which is endangered. The Schedule Second for a lesser endangered species. Do you guys remember? So similarly here also, the Appendix One is. for the most endangered species right so when you put a species under appendix 1 it would really help in their transboundary conservation why because we feel that there is a high threat to them and if the nations don't come together for example prakash or i don't know if you you were not there in those youtube sessions i had shown the entire range of asian elephants i have shown you the entire range of the tigers because of the project tiger uh, reports that have come recently so if these nations actually collaborate they can lead to better conservation but that is for extremely endangered species now if you look at option number 2 why you can directly put it as wrong appendix 1 says that they need global cooperation for favorable conservation status it's a very mild statement whereas appendix 2 says those threatened with extinction don't you think that the statements should be reversed appendix 1 should list those threatened with extinction and appendix 2 should list those in the need of global cooperation for favorable conservation status so they are being conserved but they can be conserved in a better manner if they are put under appendix 2 because that will call in for a global conservation status or they will be uh, people will globally cooperate to uh, make the things better for that species so that's why option 2 becomes if you give it a close reading automatically wrong if you utilize some amount of common sense right and hence the correct answer becomes 1 and 3 got it all right okay so coming here basically cms is a treaty of 129 countries plus european union it does function under unep there was an entire article in the indian express because india had put a proposal in cop 13 which is which happened in gandhi nagar so it is also known as gandhi nagar convention all right in fact india has done a, recently a lot when it comes to climate or when it comes to ecosystem preservation we are working really hard on that so here our prime minister modi had proposed three species so remember because these three species are important from the ecology and environment point of view one is the asian elephant the other is the bengal florican and the third is the great indian bustard so these three were proposed to be added to the schedule 1 of the cms and they were indeed added to the schedule 1 of the cms so what he said was that asian elephant entire used to once be found from west asia till in china now only 13 asian countries have the asian elephants and in fact the highest population of asian elephants is in india approximately 30000 right as of 2017 it might have declared, uh, decreased so if there is a better coordination amongst the countries by the virtue of this species being listed in appendix 1 it would really help in increasing its habitat area reducing its killing and further 
enhancing the level of protection that is accorded to the Asian elephant. So that's one. Are we guys clear? What I want you guys to do and locate the Yangtze River in China. Also, go and mark the uh, range status of Asian elephants. It will give you a better idea. I've already done it in the class. So download the Unacademy notes. Prakash already, I think, has all the PDF of the Unacademy notes. So Prakash, it is in one of those notes only. I have given you the entire uh, geographical range of these Asian elephants. Great Indian Bustard, it is the state animal of my state, Rajasthan. Very famously not found here, extinct in the wild now. So it is a critically endangered species. Now only 150 individuals left. I call it, uh, it's a critically endangered as per IUCN. But in uh, Rajasthan, it's hardly seen, very hardly seen. Uh, its present habitats had shrunk to 10%. In fact, most of these birds, do you know how they die? They die because of the fencing on the Indo-Park border. So most of them run into the fences and get electrocuted. So they are typically, their habitat is the desert area. And so they are mostly found in Rajasthan, the great Indian bustard. Neelam, have patience. If you can't listen, then you can very well leave the class. I don't have a problem. But I don't like to be interrupted when I'm teaching. All right? So be very careful with that. I am the instructor. I control what I'm supposed to teach. If you are that impatient with an exam which takes almost an year to clear, you better be preparing for something else. So I don't like interruptions in my class. You've done this twice. In the first instance, I didn't correct you, but I absolutely don't like it. The third is the Bengal florican. All right. This is again a species that belongs to the uh, bustard family, the same as the great Indian bustard. And it is also a South Asian subspecies. So usually now it is only found in the Indo-Gangetic plains, the Terais and the Duars grasslands. So you guys already know that in the map of India, just underneath your, when the Himalayan ranges enter, it's the Shivalik part of the mountains which is the Terai and the Duar regions. Uh, Mangesh, it's not map related questions per se, but UPSC has these kind of questions. It will give you names of three wildlife centuries. One you will be knowing, the, for the rest two you can bang your head on the wall because you will not know where it has come from. So that's the usual pattern. So they don't give you the maps. I am showing it to you on the map so that the retention is higher. Otherwise, you can take a list of the wildlife centuries and the states where are they, but it's a little difficult to remember. And any which ways, if you know the map of India, you are going to kill it in the mains. All right. Uh, this article is entirely from the Indian Express article. You can read it. You can take a snapshot of this uh, page or this slide if you want. All right. So at the COP 13, seven species were added to Appendix 1. All right, which provides the strictest protection. So that was Asian elephant, jaguar, very famous Indian cat also, great Indian bustard, Bengal florican. I will show you the images of all these three in the next session. Little bustard, Antipodian albatross, there was a very famous poem about albatross, and oceanic white tip shark. So I'll show you all of these, uh, I think in the next session, I'll have enough time to put on the picture, so that I'll do. Another important point about this conference was the status of migratory species report that was released here. Understandably, uh, the importance of this report is, I will tell you the crux in one line, that even though the species are being preserved under this uh, convention or this treaty, yet there is a decline being observed in approximately 78% of the migratory species listed under CMS. So that is a very important takeaway from this report, which you should remember. All right. Yes, Suman, ancient Marina. Uh, when I started studying off it in the first place, I was not able to get a hang of it. It took me almost, I think, 30 to 40 readings to understand what they were talking about. But yes, albatross, albatross my, uh, around my neck is a very famous English expression now. Anyways, your time starts now for question number 14. This should be easily done. We, I'm just changed the names just to make you remember the entire philosophical school so that you don't do it wrong, any which ways. So I should get the answers. Yes. 
Yeah, Suman, you're right. It's actually about symbolism. And the very famous line is, ocean, ocean, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Very famous line. <sighs> Are they all correctly matched, Akash? We discussed, we've discussed this question thrice now. Do you want to check? Sorry, wildlife century? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I... <laughs> Sorry, it's the philosophical philosopher and philosophical school. I'm sorry. But you understand the intent, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Akash, Neelam, Suman, it is incorrect. It's not D. All are not correct. We have done this a lot of times and still if people are getting it correct, it's not a good thing. All right, it's not D Abrar, it's not D Mangesh, it's B Kaveri, you're right. In fact, Kaveri, you have been performing very well in the an academy sessions also. Pretty proud of you. Very nicely done. Afreen, what happened? Yes, Gemini is not Vedanta. Then what is he? Mimansa. Or Anekantvad, the famous story of the elephant being observed by 10 blindfolded people. Kapil Muni, we discussed the Sankhya philosophy already. Kannad is Vaisheshika. Prakash, where is your answer? Or you want to skip this one? So the correct answer is 1 and 3 only. We have done this a lot of times. Vesistrika is about the atomic theory. Right? So the solution is B. We have already discussed these six schools a lot of times. I keep discussing them again and again. So till the time each one in my class remembers all the names, we will keep doing it. Do you remember who gave Nyaya? We discussed it day before yesterday. It's okay, Afreen. Who discovered Nyaya? It was Gautam. Yes. Vesisika Kannad. Vedanta was Badrayan. Yoga Patanjali. Sakya Kapilmuni. And Mimansa Gemini. Right? Okay, Prakash is not getting out of the moon. Any which ways. Coming back, uh, the map question, take the snapshot, click a picture, do whatever you want. And after a minute and a half, I will move on to the question part of it. All right. Yes, Akash, you're right. It's Gautam. Akash remembers and yet he answers incorrectly. So have we taken the snapshot? Prakash, this you should be able to do. We discussed a lot of things yesterday in the Unacademy session at night. And so goes for Jairam. And Afreen was also there, I guess. Sivranjani was not there. Suman was there for a while. Mangesh and Abrar, I also take a session on Unacademy at 8.30pm in the evening. Mostly daily, except for the days I'm ill. But this YouTube sessions, it happens almost every alternate day. This is a fixed session. So this will go on till your prelims. Alternate days, 11 a.m. in the morning. All right, noted. Everybody, should we move on? Should I move to the next to the question slide? All right, there is your question. Okay, so there goes your question. Answer Aram say, I'll give you 40 seconds to answer because you have to match the things also. So do it and read the question carefully.
marketing teacher so are you doing mba are you an mba student komal where are you doing your mba from kotler philip kotler right all right guys time to answer we start with 30 seconds to answer all right afreen has answered another 25 seconds sevranjani jairam neelam sanjeev kaveri all of you got it correct guys are getting pretty good with the mapping skills pretty amazed very nice all right okay prakash see you got it correct are you back to the moon uh miss or mr milky way it's not c have you read it correctly i've asked for the incorrect option yes komal the answer is a mangesh you're right the answer is a so 1 2 3 5 is correct all right let's actually go and check why these things are incorrect so your b is your yucatan peninsula i don't know if i can change the nib of this pen no i can't uh all right this part is your yucatan peninsula mexico all right this part is your canadian shield which was pretty easy to guess right i think the canadian shield is the biggest giveaway this is your libyan desert this part is your falkland islands those who attended the unacademy session yesterday do you remember i said i will be asking the falkland islands very near to cape horn about which i did as yes i know mr milky way miss milky way whoever you are yes libya is d very far acha very far from the moon okay this here is the altai mountains central asia all right and this here is your mount cook i discussed about it in yesterday's session yes okay so i'll show it to you again on the map mount cook here all right altai mountains above gobi desert gobi desert we discussed in the day before yesterday's session which is what it's in mongolia and china it's a cold desert just like the ladakh one yes libya we discussed libyan desert here then we discussed the falkland islands and i discussed the cape horn canadian shield is here and there you have the yucatan peninsula very famous peninsula are we good everybody so i'll move on to the next question the rapid fire round all right now this is the most interesting part so top 3 fastest 3 so all the newcomers those who answered in the least amount of time i will give you just 30 seconds to answer there might or might not be a timer i think i forgot to add the timer again i will give you 30 seconds to both read and answer the top 3 who answer correctly in the 30 seconds will be the winners for that question so after 5 questions we'll see uh, how many of you have figured the maximum times in the top 3 in the 5 questions that will be declared the winner of the round all right So are we clear with the uh, rounds and the rules? Question number sixteen on your screens and your thirty seconds start now. I think I will have to go and make that change today itself. I am forgetting those slides. Chengiz Khan, quite possible, Akash. Mangesh, you will remember the whole map. you are a civil services student you should know about geography you should know you must know world geography is in your course paper 1 gs if you remember the map you are able to answer questions that's the intent how do you do geography without a map mangesh i don't understand that <laughs> all right 20 seconds to go
15 seconds to go. Ah, I think, uh, all right, I think I have my top three already. Neelam, Akash and Vijay. A is not the correct answer. Option number C is correct. This was actually mentioned in Prime Minister's Man Ki Baat. The February edition. February 2020 edition. All right. So, do you remember we discussed the four generations of fuel, fuel yesterday or day before yesterday? I think I discussed it in the academy session. Now I'm getting confused. Four generations of fuel. So, the first one is from the, um, what do you say? The edible parts. It's produced from food only. So that's the first generation of fuel. All right. So coming here, they, the AN-32 aircraft, it's one of the large aircrafts of the Indian Air Force. They have used a 10% blend of the uh, this uh, tree-borne oil or a man-made fuel, which is made from Jetrofa, is a very famous non-edible uh, oil-making item. So both 1 and 2 are correct. And... My top three are Neelam. All right. Uh, so I'll just write down your names. Neelam is there. Akash is there. And Vijay is there. Vijay, where are you from? Are you from Maharashtra or south somewhere? All right. So the Jetro for oil that was actually put into these aircraft was sourced from Chhattisgarh Biodiesel Development Authority and then processed at the Indian Institute of Petroleum, Dehradun. My brother studies there. If you want to know more about this biojet fuel, you can go and read this article in the Indian Express. So biojet fuel, Indian Air Force AN-32 explained. It's under the explained section and it's from February 2020 news. So, all of you who have answered C are correct. Jetrofa is actually a plant that can yield you oil. The seeds can yield you oil. Just like opium seeds yield you uh, drugs which you can get high on. Jetrofa is actually grown. It's a kind of a cash crop only, agriculturally grown to get seeds, uh, to get oil out of its seeds. So, Jetrofa is a plant species. Yes, Naveen? So, Vijay is from Maharashtra, right? Okay. Let's move on to the next question and your 30 seconds start now. We already discussed the difference between ICJ and ICC. So, this is another question from there. It's a static GK question. So, let's see. And it is a commonsensical question. So, utilize your common sense before you answer anything. All right. Another 20 seconds to go. All right, your time's up. Another two seconds. All right, I got my top three. Akash, Neelam and Komal. Yes, it's B. The giveaway is you will never have representatives from the government as a part of the court. A court is supposed to be an unbiased body, right? So the people who are selected are usually not uh, representatives of the governments. So, are we good? 17 is B. And the procedure of removal is, if the other members of the court, they think that this person is no longer unbiased, no longer serving the needs of the court, then he is dismissed. But it has to be a unanimous decision, consensus decision. Are we good? Alright, so most of you answered it correctly. Uh, Okay, so all of these, usually the people who are put there as judges have been judges or somewhere related to quasi-judicial or judicial bodies in the past. So you need to have a good track record to be a part of ICJ. 
you wouldn't just put up anybody there so that's the uh, thing and the removal or dismissal of judges from the icj has never happened so do you guys remember icj it's a un body prime justice body of the un established in 1946 headquarters in hague netherlands remember and it deals with stuff like sovereignty border issues etc whereas the icc deals by genocides war crimes aggression crimes etc the four things that we discussed do you guys remember we discussed it both in the an academy session i think prakash was late in that class and in the youtube sessions all right next question on your screens and that's why neelam i was asking you to listen to me very carefully and patiently if you have listened you can do this question nicely so your 30 seconds start now yes prakash i think you give me the same example every time i discuss that right prakash that's your only memory of that okay yeah navin and afreen were also there 20 seconds to go Five more seconds. Five more seconds. Anybody wants to answer? All right. I got my top three: Neelam, Sivranjini, and Sanjeev. Prakash, why are you taking so much time to answer? Kaveri, Vijay, Jairam, Supong, Prakash. It's incorrect. It's not B. It's not one and three. Prakash, we discussed that very recently. So option number two is correct. One, two, and three. Right? Okay. So my top three are Neelam, Sivranjini, and Sanjeev. The answer is D. All the three are correct. We just discussed this. I have to show you the photo. so i'll show you the photo in the coming session on 25th all right coming on question number 19 very easy if you have attended my india ir series you can easily answer this because i discussed this in detail there so your time starts now why prakash why are you confused what happened are you upset that your preparation is all scattered around here and there and you see nothing in light what might happen very anxious if you're anxious calm down that anxiety it will cost you a great deal in the exam remember my words calm down that anxiety you don't have to be anxious you're very well prepared i've seen you over the long course of time i've been seeing you since june april june so it's okay all right 10 seconds more to go I already got my top 3 Akash Sanjeev and Himanshu very good Yes it's option number D All right So where has Neelam gone has she run away All right So most of you have answered it correctly it was pretty easy Navin it's not B and Vijay it's not A it's D actually I have talked about this in fact uh, this should have been ready by 2020 but they only started working on it in May 19 So India is giving funding it's one of the largest hydroelectric power plants in the India IR series on Indo Bhutan relations I have shown the entire map I think most of the map uh, which talks about the hydroelectric power plants in Bhutan almost all of them are run by india only so we have a huge stake when it comes to hydro power coming from bhutan to india we are importing it from bhutan so that they can repay us back the loans which we give to them to develop hydroelectric power plants and that's one of a major cause of concern for bhutan also it says 
that most of the things that india does in time, terms of hydroelectric power plants the terms of the terms and conditions are usually more favorable to india than it is to bhutan but it can then go and scream as much as it wants because definitely it cannot go to china so you have to come to india so with that it's a 720 megawatt run of the river plant on the mangdechu river in throngsa throngchang district of central bhutan no need to remember this but mangdechu remember yes and the mangdechu hydroelectric power authority uh, they initiated in 2010 and uh, but they have only started the funding and the work very recently that's april may 90 that's why i put it here and the entire initiative we are trying to generate 10000 megawatt hydro power by 2020 with indian support so we are still not there we are trying to do that but i have discussed the entire hydroelectric power uh, uh, what you say collaboration with bhutan in detail in the india ir series uh, which is already available on the youtube all right so you can go search for the india ir series sidhi bangar with that name so i have discussed the entire indian neighborhood left right center wherever you want it's a 21 video series each of the lectures have is based on one country uh, relation with india and every country's relations have been discussed in great detail there last question of the day uh is it you all right all right i'll just check yes amanshu uh i'll just check if it's not sanjeev it's neelam all right yes you're right neelam it's you i will just put your name is that okay i have put your name question number 20 your time has already started so 25 seconds remaining this is a sitter all right 20 seconds all right i got my top 3 lal bahadur shastri it's pretty easy do you know who had set up the servants of people society lala lajpat rai in 1921 in lahore now the headquarters have moved to delhi post independence all right so it is in the telegraph lane in delhi so the headquarters are there this servants of the people society was specifically set up so that people could be trained as volunteers to serve their motherland and gain independence right and he was the one who definitely promoted wildlife white revolution and green revolution signed the tashkent declaration with pakistan but nonetheless could not live long enough to actually see the fruits of the revolutions that he started so that's there with you and he also had signed another agreement with sri lankan prime minister sirimavo bandanayak i have already discussed in an india sri lanka relations in the youtube series to deal with the status of indian tamils in ceylon right and then a lot of things have actually happened so this agreement is also known as the shrimavo shastri pact if you want you can go and study it a little bit it will give you some idea about the uh, sri lankan polity and how india has been intervening so with that we come to a close today i will announce the winners uh thanks prakash all right so my top 3 here are akash neelam and prakash so there is an obvious winner here i don't uh, need to mince words so for question number 16 it was neelam akash vijay for question number 17 it was akash neelam komal 18 neelam Sivranjini and Sanjeev, nineteenth Akash Neelam Himanshu, and twentieth Akash Neelam Prakash. So I think Neelam is definitely the clear winner, closely followed by Akash. So Akash and Neelam, congratulations to both of you. But today my winner is Neelam. All right, she's the winner of the rapid fire round. So very good, Neelam. I think it's the first time you made it to the leaderboard, the top of the leaderboard, right? All right, guys. Uh, see you guys on 
YouTube on 25th August and an academy probably today itself. I will try to have a session scheduled at night or otherwise tomorrow itself on an academy. I have a session at 8.30 p.m. The tomorrow session is for sure. Today I'll have to check. It's a Sunday and uh, the weather is not very good. So congratulations Neelam. And I must say most of my students are brilliant. It's a pleasure to teach you guys. Absolute delight, absolute pleasure. I need to see more names here and hope you have an amazing morning. The rest of your day is spent well doing preparation for your prelims. So all the best for that. All right. Uh, Komal, the class, this YouTube class happens alternate days. So the next class is on 25th August 11 a.m. All right. And please subscribe to the channel uh, UPSC CSE in Academy in English, an Academy UPSC CSE in English, so that you can get a, keep getting the notifications. All right. You're very welcome. All right, Akash. Uh, is that clear, Komal? Does that help? All right. With that, I'll close for today. Thank you and have a very, very good day. Uh, yes, Prakash, don't be upset. Go revise, revise as much as you can. It is okay. There will be things which you will not know. But that's why I keep saying that keep attending the classes. You, uh, if you would have been able to come to the classes regularly on the YouTube sessions, the sessions are more informative. All right, Komal. So I hope to see you in the next session, Komal. Subscribe to the channel. You'll keep getting the notifications. Are we good? Good day, Manshu. Good day, folks. Chalo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.